small index subfactors with a very narrow view of the entire subject. And there are very many other perspectives on, uh, on thinking about subfactors and planar algebras and treatment strategies besides uh, only thinking about the small index ones. And I want to emphasize that although all of this work has been done on the small index case, there are lots of other things we ought to be doing as well. This has just been an easy place to start. Uh, and Ritz already learned something. It's given us uh, access to some new examples and some new phenomena, but we shouldn't be too parochial about it. There's a lot of other things to, to look at. Now, the other sense in which uh, this is very narrow is that uh, I've drawn this little map here with a little, with a little Bayesian plane with the with index along the bottom here. And I've written uh, up to index six here, but if I kept going, I'm going. And going. We'd, we'd still just be at the very beginning of the subject, and there's no reason to expect that the stuff we've seen so far on these boards here told us anything about what happens in this case. Okay? We're really looking through a tiny little microscope here. Tiny little microscope here. So you can imagine that, that one day uh, we'll, you know, we'll get this sample pop it down itself back up, we'll look down below us, and we'll see everything that's going on. Uh, but this little map here is just a map of sort of the parking lot, which we failed out of the park. Okay? Uh, small index subfactors is maybe a, a fail that leads out of the parking lot into the forest. But by the time we're getting up to here, where I'm going to be talking about by the end of these lectures, the path has kind of faded out. So the undergrowth is getting kind of thick. And we can see that there are cliffs ahead, but they're not equipped to climb at all. Uh, we're, we're really, really, really quickly Okay. So, where possible through this, I'll try and describe other points of view besides the small index. Okay, so let's get started. So the first uh, theorem in terms of classification that starts everything off, uh, I guess subsequent to uh, 
the famous theorem of points that uh, David's already explained to you, that the index of subfactors is point A and below index 4, you just see numbers of the form 4 cosine uh, squared i over n. Uh, is it a theorem that tells you exactly what subfactors is in theory? Because it's, 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 it's a prototypical theorem. What are we talking about? Index of form 4. Many people, many of you in the room, you can say some names, but not the philosophy. Okay. The first step is an easy observation, but an essential one, is that the principal graph must be an infinite diagram. So essentially, one had this idea that when you're looking at a subject, you can extract this purely combinatorial invariant of the principal graph. And as soon as you've done that, you, have, you get to see a lot about index less than four, just because the norm of the principal graph, that is the, uh, the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrices in the graph, is the square root of the index. Okay, so we're looking at below index four, our principal graph must have norm less than two. We just found that many graphs, because it's just a classical theorem that the graph norm less than two, there's other graphs. Okay. So that's just the observation that you can use the principal graph and read off the index in the principal graph to get this stuff. And maybe let me just say something a little bit here uh, with the, uh, well, let's start. The, 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 remember the principal graph is telling you the, the, the simple objects uh, associated, with, the simple binary things associated with, with the subfactor. And so I'm going to write one thing. Well, I'll write uh, star for the trivial binary. The principal graph is always it's got one vertical perspective. Yeah. Is this graph line actually like, a proof of the index term that you just talked about all graphs and the graph line is that the whole graph? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, is this a proof that the index term is a. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'll just say here with star on the longest arm. That is, not only do we know that the principal graph is some Lincoln diagram, we know which vertex is the, is the trivial binary. But I, I just don't know. I'm just wondering. Is that yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the principal graph must be a Lincoln diagram. That's the first point of the theorem. Uh, the second one is that. Uh, Graphs d odd in E7 don't extend to a fusion ring. So I think I better explain the briefly what that means. So remember what the principal graph was. Just, uh, for now, just repeating something from today's lecture. It was vertices, the principal graph for uh, subfactor and segment. The vertices are the simple AA, AB, BA, and DB bimodules. Well, it's not all of the bimodules, that would be ridiculous. Uh, it's just uh, those appearing in, uh, if you take B, the big algebra, Take a big tensor product uh, over A some number of times. You take big, ten take big tensor powers of B tensioning each time over the smaller algebra. You can decompose that into smaller binomials over all the different algebras. You only take a subset of the binomials in this. The vertices are the simple binomials, and uh, there are Q on. The Q uh, edges between Q. So you take a. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you uh, basically you, you take the two vertices, you, you tensor one of them with the, the big algebra, you compose that into simples again, and just count how many properties Q appears in. 
principal grant of recording, the tensor product multiplicity is for entering with the feedback, entering with the feedback, the feedback. Okay? But it's only a tiny fraction of the full fusion modules. All of these bind modules you can tensor with each other. You can tensor two DB bind modules together, you get another DB bind module, you can tensor these two together, uh, you get an AA bind module, and so on. And all those tensor product multiplicities form a, a fusion module. Okay, so it's just so the tensor product that it has to be associated with, and that's just a whole lot of constraints on the integers telling you how many properties of one sort of bind module there are in the tensor product module. And this graph is just recording a small piece of that fusion module, just a, a subset of those numbers telling you the tensor product multiplicity. And sometimes it's just not possible to write down the tensor product multiplicity. It extends the garbage very far. So that's the proof that not all the graphs appear. And now we have to explain uh, how to realize them. As I said, realization is going to be the focus of what I talk about for the rest of the lecture. So AN realized by uh, quotients of temporary leave and pure root of mu. They talk a lot about uh, temporary leave. Uh, you know, the Q this parameter that determines the loop parameter by the loop parameter D is P plus Q inverse. Uh, and I'm probably already upsetting the form by talking about a quotient of temporary leave. So as far as he's concerned, temporary leave is already the quotient of temporary leave. But I prefer to take the view that temporary leave is just the abstract thing defined by diagrams and relations. And sometimes you need to take the quotient of temporary leave to prove that it's an inverse of temporary leave. This is stuff that I can say talks about in some detail. We won't actually need to go through this uh, So V evens. A4n minus 3 by a process called de equivariantization, which I'm going to talk about in a little while. But I want to emphasize already that you can see sort of part of the provision of uh, the construction technique that I'm going to be emphasizing. An here sort of came from somewhere external. This is something about quantum groups of distribution. Whereas the d2ns are just taking a, a subfactor plane of algebra we already knew about and doing something to it because it's an easy one. And I'm going to try and emphasize in all the, the all the classifications that I draw which things are kind of just new stuff and old stuff and which stuff is genuinely new stuff. Uh, and finally, uh, E6 and E8 uh, arise as module categories. For algebra objects in uh, in suitable A N, so there's some algebraic construction in group starting with particular. I forget what it is. It's like A11 for E6 and A29 for E8 or something like that. But anyway, there's particular algebraic construction in group starting with these A N subfactors. And getting to the okay, and getting into the construction of those objects. Right, before we do that, let's uh, try and fill in the chart so far. So here's this one parameter family of the uh, of the D two N subfactors. Here's this one parameter family of the A N subfactors, and then um, here's these two points for E six. Tiny little picture of the principal graph of E6. There's an even tinier picture of the principal graph of E8. And if you stop and count and you look at E8 and you put the, the starred vertex on the longest arm of E8, you'll see that there are four edges in E8 before you get to the triple point. And so that's why I've drawn this dot on this line. This is a four super transitive picture. It starts with a chain of four edges starting from the trivial bind module before. Uh, question, uh, 
Yeah, so there are an awful lot of IDE classifications out there. Uh, and uh, I guess I guess I don't actually know to the extent to which you can you can translate one classification into another. Uh, So I think that the dictionary is not just the classification we worry about these days. Okay, so let me uh, just go in a little bit more depth. So here, here is uh, E2. One super transitive. The and then uh, there are half as many beams. And I guess I didn't say it over here because, I, as I said, I'm, I'm going to mostly avoid talking about uniqueness and how many realizations of each one there are. But in fact, there's, there's two non isomorphic subfactors in each of these 68 rather than each of these. There's a, there's a unique subfactor for each particular one. <coughs> Should say uh, these notes, such as they are, are online or on my webpage. You can just Google for my name and click on talks and find the PDF. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing to say about these notes is that they're both uh, wildly incomplete, but also uh, far too long for the lectures that I have. So don't hesitate to derail me at any point. I don't really care to share them. So, Scott, what are the assumptions now on E? Is it important that it's 61 times or something? Yeah, so. Uh, my preferred thing to say would be to say that I'm classifying subfactor planar algebras in one of these cases, and you should you should not worry too much about the subfactor assessment. Now, uh, if you want to, if you if you insist on caring about one random algebra, then we can extract from the statement statements about about the number of So uh, later on. Maybe, yeah, so. Is there um, some Morita equivalence going on here? Is that what you're saying? So, The main content of this is definitely in uh, non corpus papers, but uh, the story is a little complicated and, and various ways of realizing examples and so on can seem to be rather beyond. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the full history there. Apologies to the people in the room who might be interested in what I'm saying. Um, maybe uh, the, on the point of, of getting of historical accuracy, uh, uh, Vaughan and Noah Snyder and I recently wrote a survey paper. Basically, on the content of this talk and, and related things uh, that's in the, the bulletin of the 
ANS, where we hopefully get the history mostly right. Uh, and we shouldn't complain about any mistakes they make in the store historically, but do tell us about mistakes we've made. Sorry that I didn't actually state these theorems particularly clearly. Uh, let me just put a, a standing first sentence on all of the, the theorems I'm writing up today. Uh, these subfactor planar algebras with index large and classifiers and, and linkings. Well, I'll, I'll link in subfactors with the subfactor planar algebras and linkings as well. Okay, the principal graph must be a half line thinking guy. That's again just some sort of old graph theory. Uh, you notice I realize this planar algebra is by taking uh, E sub n, and it doesn't matter whether you write E sub n plus or minus here, they're the same. You can take the endomorphisms of the tensor power of a two dimensional vector space. Here's the morphism which are G linear, uh, G a certain of S and T. So for example, the affine thinking diagrams, the affine E6, the affine E7, the affine E8. Um, okay. Which uh, sorry, um, Want to, uh, we certainly want to allow G being everything. That's, uh, that's one case, and all the others are the other. Okay. Uh, so, for example, the, the affine E6, E7, and E8 thinking diagrams are realized by the binary tetrahedral, binary octahedral, and binary quadrilateral groups. But you can also look at the particular things I did with the and so on, and at other things. Unfortunately, Saying this doesn't actually uniformly realize all of them. And I realized while preparing this that I don't actually know a completely uniform construction for a function of radius star. I only know I only know two different ways to get it. Um, so the others come. Uh, so the Turing vector, the others come from all. I wish I knew what slightly changed. Okay, so let's just do all that in in our chart. Um, it's all going to go on the same line, so it's not actually going to be super informative, but we'll just write in the chart. Let's, let's do it. Uh, the main thing that I want to point out is that uh, there are infinitely many things down here, which are one super transitive down here, and in particular, all of the affine genes. Whether this sort of phenomenon occurs in at various places later on is going to be a really interesting question that's just been resolved recently. Oh, and then there's a few more things I can add to my excellent degree of that. I guess I should put F I need six F I need seven in here. Which I think you might be interested in. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to do one dot for one thing. So uh, the, the places where there, there are cohomological twists are all down here. Uh, there's, there's one super transitive twist. And there's really just one thing up here that's not anything else. There's a lot of hiding in this dot. But maybe the thing to say about it is that everything hiding in this dot is really about, uh, comes from finite group functions. It comes from finite group data in, in cohomological. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, good point. Okay. So, uh, um, 
there are some factors which are not irreducible. That is, the principal graph talks right away. That is, the, our favorite object, our favorite Lie model that we're using to generate the principal graph uh, is not a single Lie model. Okay? And so you really should call that CFC to check that this thing is not a block. And if this graph is not a block, prove it to the first actor. Here's where things start to get uh, kind of goofy. Uh, this is uh, parts of it going from 4 up to 3 plus scalar 2 or 3 plus scalar 3. Uh, it's a bit harder, well, hardly bit harder, and then uh, what they say, many, uh, including lots and lots of people in the middle. So, Ten subfactors find the algebras. Besides a infinity, which at this point on is a curse at every single index, and we're going to ignore it. Although it is if you're, if you're interested in the subfactor rather than the planar algebra, this little uh, parenthetical aside here hides enormous difficulties in just basically knowing. Uh, at a given index, how to describe what subfactors there are in the planar uh, algebra. But I'm going to stay in the world where I only care about the planar algebras. So, 10 subfactor planar algebras, uh, potentially coming in five cases. Uh, I should draw their graphs somewhere. Okay, I'm going to draw their graphs here. The principal graph. I'm going to be a little bit lazy uh, whenever I draw principal graphs. If you remember, the principal graph comes in two components, two disconnected components, corresponding to uh, the left A module and the left B module, and they never edges. The edges only go between modules of the same left sort, so that that's equal to two disconnected components. And I'm going to be lazy and just often not draw these edges. There's the extended bar group. And here there are seven edges at the beginning, seven superparameters, seven otherwise inside the bar group. Theta bar group. This one, of course, is unexcitedly named because it basically the graph is very similar to Agro. This one is named after Agro because he discovered the possibility of its existence when he started classifying just the little river for and then escaped the first construction, and he turned his name to the set of Agro subfactor. Because of its construction, and then turned the name of the last set. Hybrid. Back in the early days of the classification of the winner. Um, then there's an unexcitingly named 3311 subfactor. Uh, at this point, we're just giving up on inventing names. And uh, it's described in the graph, although this is sometimes also known as. An example of a GHK subfactor, which I'll refer to later. And then there's a, another subfactor, typically just called 3231. So the, the names here are just from, from the fact that these graphs are a little, uh, a little starved and they're just not really known in the graph. And this one is also sometimes called the Zoom Zoom.
And they said there were 10, but only like there were five coming down here. So each of these coming pairs, unfortunately in different sorts of pairs, uh, these four here, the subfactor is not self-dual, that is, the P n plus spaces are not the same as the P n minus spaces, so you can always just relabel plus and plus is minus and obtain a different kind of algorithm. These guys come in four dual pairs. This guy on the other hand is self dual, P n pluses are just the same as the P n minuses. And moreover, there's a kind of algebra isomorphism to the genome, but it's not uh, it's not real. It's not this conjugation. It's not this conjugation. So this one comes with this kind of conjugate pair, and these four come with this kind of conjugate pair. Oh. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds like you want me to draw them. Uh, let me draw them in small. Small up here. The supertransitivity of the two graphs is always the same. Uh, you can explain. Uh, you can get those pHs, and therefore one of the same and one of the fourth again. Extended high width is the same, it's just that this is transitivity. And this one, I guess, I've never. Um, five super transitives and okay. Uh, and these guys are they're looking back at the That sounds familiar, right? Yeah, I knew something that was the same as two edges somewhere. Okay, so the same as five super transitives. And then you've got every four, and then another four, and then another four, and then four. Okay, so let's draw all of those in. <coughs> Someone with the computer look up for me. <laughs> computer form. Okay. okay, so where are we? Uh, there's the hugger. Uh, the index is just barely about four, as it turns out. There's the extended hugger with a slightly higher index. There's the seta hugger. Here. Most of them are kind of nice even numbers. Five plus square root, you know, five plus square root is what you know, two. Five plus square root is 17 over two. Five plus square root is 21 over two. There's a pattern. There's no pattern drawn. <laughs> this one is just some degree three extensions that can't lie down because it's a degree three extension. I don't have any good explanation for why these numbers look so similar, but that might be because it's a better computer. Okay, so what did we see? Well, basically, I mean, the first thing to point out is just that the, this discreteness of the index phenomenon that one shows below four keeps going. As long as you don't, as long as you leave out the A infinity subfactors, which are admittedly a complicated subfactor with extremely easily treated algebras, you've still got a discrete spectrum. The other thing to point out is that it's kind of real weird. These guys, these five, well, they look like they don't have to do with each other. Well, maybe the first two look like they've got something to do with each other. Um, but yeah, it looks strange to me. So we're definitely going to, uh, when we return to doing construction, we're going to spend a lot of time 
uh, explaining uh, how you construct all of these guys and trying to give the best possible construction that makes them look the most plausible and inevitable. And roughly the answer is going to be that at this point, the GHJ has a very simple explanation. It's kind of classical. If you, if you, if you think quantum groups are classical, it's going to be one line of the Lagrangian function. And then, algorithm 2221 uh, fall into families, which we have some understanding of now and know how to turn a crank into one example. Uh, I'd say you have to apply a much more convoluted and quite interesting story does come from the same sort of machinery that produces 3311 and 3321, and then you simplify those numbers. Yes, sir. So, the fact that the SIG is not the same as the Okay. Which is the three axis. Oh, and then it's your three axis. Okay. Very good. There's a dual between your five axes and this stuff. And then you know, okay, so we've got all those in the jar. <coughs> and now we've just got two more theorems to go. Well, I guess I could technically do three, just three more theorems, but I'm going to spare you one of them. Two more theorems to go, even though I've explained everything in like a rather small amount of time. So it's about the small number of questions. Okay. Okay. The classification looks like exactly fine. So maybe, uh, well, so. Uh, there are seven. Subfactor primary algebra groups. All group subgroup primary algebra groups. So this is again an example of a sort of uniform construction. I'll come back and explain them later. But I want to emphasize it's not super exciting. It's really thinking about that. All group subgroups. Many algebras or duals. Sorry. I'm just going to quickly write down. Yep, as usual. Yep, I'm a little, little good for that. For that remembering that we sort of need deep experience so we can have another way of thinking about it. Okay. I'm not entirely sure I'll just end up writing down what all these group subgroups are. Uh, maybe the point is just to emphasize that uh, even though it looks like a kind of bizarre list, uh, if you sit down and think about your finite groups and think about finite groups with, uh, with actions on five element sets for a little while, trends in actions on five element Down and work out exactly what kind of members, what group subgroup planar algebras are possible that will happen to land in the S5. And then there's obviously content of this theorem saying that there's nothing except for group subgroup planar algebras in the same way. So let me just briefly draw the graphs. Uh, again, uh, this time I actually do have. These graphs that I'm drawing are all uh, are all relatively simple looking graphs, but of course that's just a, a reflection of the fact that when it comes to the microscope, you only see very small things. Okay, uh, maybe the thing to say about those pictures that we've lectured to do up here. I'm not sure I can get say talked about this. Uh, it's something that we all need about principal graphs is that there's, um, 
there a, a <coughs> line holder within the subtract that's running out of Or, uh, I mean, if you're looking at the subtract, you can put a line holder in the fuel line holder. The fuel in the plane of algebras, uh, we can say, what it means to fuel. Uh, we can describe the fuel as a, uh, as a projection of person with reference to the principle. And very often when we're doing classifications, we need to not only remember this combinatorial boundary of the principal graph, but we're missing this asymptotic composition. This is also absolutely essential that we need to remember this data and which simple object to uh, draw to itself. And the, the way we always do this is by drawing little red arcs in these graphs. Anything that's uh, anything that's um, so first of all. If you're at an even depth along these graphs, that means you're an AA bimodule or a BB bimodule. And if you're an AA bimodule, then you're dual to another AA bimodule. And you have to be dual to one at the same depth. That's an easy in fact. Uh, and so for objects at even depth, just these red lines suffice to show what you're dual with. Now, uh, at odd depths, this vertex here, say, corresponds to an AB bimodule. It's going to be dual to some BA bimodule. And our universal convention, and we can go up to the top of that, <laughs> what is that bit? Uh, our universal convention is that, uh, so that's an odd depth here. This is an odd depth here. Okay, so these two vertices here have to be dual to the vertices on the other graph. So rather than drawing red lines connecting the two different graphs which get rather messy, we, uh, we always just say that the first vertex at a given odd depth you can read up the page the way you've drawn the graph is dual to the first vertex at that depth on that graph. So this guy is implicitly dual to that one. This guy is implicitly dual to that one. Okay. If you if you don't draw your graphs sort of clearly graded by depth, then it's a little bit unclear what's happening. But hopefully that's easy to work And so then including all of the dual data at a high depth is just adding this red line here. So these two objects at even depth are dual to each other. Any objects at even depth where we haven't drawn red lines are just dual to themselves. Sometimes we'll see computer people to draw red tags. We might do that, but I'll, I'll leave that out. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just see red lines and red lines above. Well. So that wasn't super exciting, the classification of index 5. Again, it was more, yeah. Uh, okay, so if we just read off the supertransitivities from the previous address there, we've got two things down here and one supertransitive. One thing up here, two supertransitive. And maybe contrary to what happens at non-integer index, lots of stuff occurs at integer indices, but it's mostly not that exciting. It's all dimensional finite numbers. And that becomes less true as we go on, but uh, it's, uh, it's good to know. That the integer and non-integer indices are, are considered very different things. Okay. What are the dimensional Ah, sorry, sorry, good question. Um, these three. Are, are still fuel planar algebras. Okay. Uh, the interchange of pluses and minuses is an isomorphism of planar algebras. These two are not so fuel, and I guess maybe I can illustrate that merely by drawing the principal graphs. Certainly, if the two principal graphs Not the same. It can't be so fuel. Uh, an isomorphism of Gn plus and Gn minus that is compatible with the planar algebra operation will give you an, a graph isomorphism. But it's not obvious, and you can, you, the converse isn't true. Uh, remember here, 3311, the two graphs are actually identical. So it's an interesting example of a non so fuel graph. Uh, and these graphs might lead you to suspect that they're so fuel. Uh, okay, so back here, these are so fuel, these come in two. Okay, 
to my last theorem is actually a theorem. Uh, so I'm going to write it as a theorem with an asterisk on it. So we indicate that we haven't actually proved this theorem yet. Um, but I feel like it's sufficiently close to being a theorem that I wanted to help with about it. Um, hopefully somehow, uh, well, there are, there are very few leftover cases in any of your classification, except for a few possibilities, and the possibility of flatlining, and uh, there's lots of interesting new results that go into proving this. Let me also mention uh, some very important books in this theorem. A fantastic paper of, uh, of Jim O'Loo's that just came out. And uh, I'm just going to read some other papers maybe. We're going to have minutes again to see some of the, the other published papers that contribute to this theorem. Okay. So, In fact, you could probably go with five and a quarter here. What was that? Uh, this? Yeah, no, no, you can use this. Ah, so it's possible you were thinking about something different. Um, I'll write a different theorem because I'm going to make questions. <laughs> um, so in the interval from five to two plus two over five, There are n subfactors in the algebra. Uh, yep, that's a very good point. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you're really Okay, and so let's see what they are. So, <laughs> 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 So the theorem that Horn had in mind is an actual theorem of a few different people. Uh, is this theorem with the additional hypothesis of one super transitivity, that is just along that, that first row of the, the chart I was showing you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. Well, no, no, no. Let, 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 me, let me say everything. It's, it's, it's a little involved. Okay, so, uh, so at some particular index, uh, five plus <coughs> two zero root five. Uh, sorry, some crazy number. Take a take the fourteenth root of unity that's closest to one. Uh, square and add one and add minus two squared, which is a little bit above five. There are two quantum group subfactors. So, like I mentioned right back at the beginning, the a n subfactor below index four, in some sense, uh, come from quantum groups, and plenty more as we go on are going to come from quantum groups. And this is the first reference to, to the one the next one show up. Uh, so, briefly, what they, what they are. They come with an SU two. Five acting on this three dimensional representation. And again, this is something that I'll talk about in different detail tomorrow. This is three, a level four. Uh, these levels are just uh, a way of encoding what root of unity you're working with in your quantum group. And those of these levels here correspond to quantum group of unity. So in both cases, we're looking at some three dimensional representation of quantum group. So this is sort of the, the adjoint representation of SU2, and this is the standard representation of SU3. You can see some of your principal graphs. We can put down about seven times. These are really some of the data we show up in the classification. Uh, but it turns out there's nothing more. 
two, you get right after three plus two, right five. And so, Tens or fifteen, and all that I encountered to be all ten subjects of linear algebras up to yours, and that's it. That's the set actually complex conjugates as well. Do you want to say this? I've only told you two of them so far. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, don't worry, that one's definitely on there. Okay. So we're continuing that theorem. Contrary to what you might think, in looking at this chart, it shows 3 plus 3 plus 5 as being almost out of 6. In fact, you're not that far along. Uh, there's the Puss Catalan linear algebra. Um, and for now, I'm just going to tantalizingly write as a free product of A3 and A4, and one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow when we discuss constructions is what exactly this. Is along with three quotients. Uh, so, the other one is a fish. The first one is a tensor product. Again, I'll explain exactly what that is tomorrow. Uh, of A3 and A4. Uh, just think of the graph that really does look like a fish. And then two more. And uh, all of these are one simple transitive. So that gives us uh, just four dots on the end. So I should have put all these sort of commas at one point. And then one simple transitive. And then a few more things. There are these subfactors I'm going to write as 3UG, so it's near a finite group, so 3 to the Z mod 2 plus Z mod 2, and 3 to the Z mod 4. Again, I'm going to say a little bit more about this construction tomorrow, but you should think of these as further instances of this family of the target region, which is Three to the z mod three. If the uh, three arms all of them, if the arms all of them three, and the arms are somehow indexed by the three z mod three. So these guys are further instances of that construction, along with something called four 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 two. This piece of the graph you can probably guess at this point. So now I'll run through the naming scheme. Uh, but let me emphasize it's not actually new. Uh, in that it's the z mod three fixed points. Z mod 2 plus Z mod 2, this plane of algebra has a finite group acting on it, that is acting on all of the, the, the vector spaces Tn plus, uh, and to deduce what the plane of algebra operation is, we can just take the fixed point to be some sub plane of algebra, and it turns out that's the real what you would call a 4442 sub factor, and something that we call now E2, so we've got two edges. <laughs> followed by a diamond, followed by two more edges. Um, if I were just to say, contains three to the z point four as a z point three. <coughs> uh, and this is actually coming from the graph as well. So these are so what to say about all of this. The stuff we knew was going to happen long ago, this quantum group solution in the form of this uh, delayed vertex. There's Puss Catalan, this, uh, this sort of universal construction free product, 
done some very simple things we had before, along with some potions, uh, which we'll be looking at in this unit, but we'll be talking about some more. There are two more things coming from uh, this family of constructions called the familiar group subfactors, the R group, uh, and group two, and then a little bit more mess that's sort of doing very close cousins. It turns out that some of these ones are close cousins to the cousins. Now, uh, what else was said? I wanted to point out uh, Liam's paper there. Uh, at first, after you learned about the Chris Catalan uh, and saw the, the possibility of these graphs, well, it looks like, from sort of just a combinatorial point of view, that you perhaps should have an infinite family of graphs and there are only more of these for, for, for the fish. And for a long time, I think everyone believed that there really was only an infinite family of quotients of the keeper here. And in fact, if you go back here to index four, uh, remember the, these were indexed by affine eigenvalues. Affine V infinity is the free product of, uh, of A3 with A3. And all of the finite affine Vs in index four look very much like quotients of that of that, uh, that affine uh, V infinity. And so sort of the combinatorial evidence was that maybe this was going to happen again. We're going to look at the free product now of A3 and A4, there's more than A2, and we're going to see this, this infinite family. And uh, the thing that is remarkable is that it just doesn't happen. And we're going to need we're going to need the first couple of So, so the, the combinatorics say that these things look really good. Uh, the, 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 I think that we, we, all, we all believe that they do. Okay, uh, I wrote Peter and Star. Let me briefly come clean with what that means. What that means is that we haven't dotted the I and crossed every T, and there are a few cases here where we're sure that some argument rules that out. Uh, we interpret that as a rule. There's one case where we just don't know what's going on. Uh, uh, more broadly, in case anyone has any brilliant ideas, they can help us. Here, I've got this sort of two parameter family. The principal graph sort of A edge is there, B edge is there, and then the dual graph is the same graph that's flipped over. But there's still A there. Now these things look very plausible. They have they have driven rings, they pass all the number theoretic tests on the dimensions of objects. Uh, they have connections, they even have connections that satisfy this uh, um, well, some condition I haven't talked about, the connection doesn't satisfy not everyone knows what these connections are. They look great in many ways. Uh, there's a lovely number theoretic result. Again, I'll, I'll get to later. Uh, as, uh, it says that if you if you fix V here, then only finitely many of these can possibly be uh, principal graphs and subfactors. Uh, and now there's a stronger number theory that's resolved by a, a scheme that more question that says that even with two parameters, at most finitely many of these can possibly be principal graphs and subfactors. And we very strongly suspect that none of them are principal graphs and subfactors because I can easily prove that A and B both have to be at least a hundred. One of them has to be at least 100. Uh, no, they both have to be 100. So there's nothing here. But we really have no idea how to treat the graph. And so that's the biggest concern I have about the star. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So maybe, so Deep Mike just pointed out something. Uh, I know I'm, I'm about to be out of time. Um, so the promise of tomorrow is to spend basically the entire time talking about how you construct some of these. And talking in particular about the, the really interesting constructions of things like you know, of things like products and quotients and free products. But I just want to briefly look at this chart for a moment. Let me try and finish filling in the dots here. There's a few more dots up here. There's 3D2 there. So these two 3D subfactors are really important here. Beyond this, we have uh, we have very little. Uh, we actually know there's nothing on supertransitive output here, except for a huge mess of stuff there. 
we've had lots of examples sitting sort of in about this area of the world where absolutely Ethereum is not even feeling the absolute sin about what could happen in this, in this next bit. Uh, but uh, one thing to say is that uh, high supertransitivity, things like extended hardware versus data hardware, really seem to be sort of hard to achieve. Uh, there are some theorems in that direction, which I'll get to later, talking about why you don't expect to see high supertransitivity sometimes. And then the, the one extra thing that I want to say is about uh, generating results with your own little findings and quotients here is that it's somehow a slightly different sense of, um, of super transitivity being hard to achieve uh, if you're going to have a quotient of this cross Catalan chain of algebra. So this cross Catalan chain of algebra could talk out just as that sort of infinite version of the head of the <laughs> so If you're going to have a quotient, it's going to look like cross Catalan for a while, and then it just gets left behind. So you would have this alternative notion of sort of cross Catalan super transitivity. That is, it looks like cross Catalan along the algebra. And uh, this, this result here says that uh, in this particular instance, you don't see high supertransitivity. High supertransitivity. And so, uh, what's the drop rate? So see, see if you're sort of repeating what the value is in here to get from this guy to this guy? It's adding so many million copies of that repeated block in case you think you've got some sort of the dual graph is important. Champagne writing and we've seen the highest super transitivity of any cell factor button to explore. So, uh, so it's certainly good. And uh, maybe another thing to say is that if there were to be a theorem, super transitivity of cell factors is bounded by 37 with minimal hypotheses, that would actually significantly help the minimal hypotheses. Uh, so that sort of comes out the same. Uh, okay, we'll talk about it. Uh, where's the next accumulation point? So you have one at, at index four, uh, this node? Um, yeah, so uh, why do accumulation points arise? Um, certainly quantum groups or groups of unity give you accumulation points because Q can become a very high order of groups of unity. Uh, <coughs> but you know, the thing to remember is that these indices correspond to the squares of dimensions of, of representations of quantum groups. And the next accumulation point quantum groups is a three square. Uh, if you just look at, at uh, but you do get accumulation points earlier on, uh, earlier, so, so that's at nine, but you obviously get accumulation points earlier on because we've got sub factors of index two here, for example, uh, A3, and so you can take the free product of A3 with either of these series that are, that are Going down to four, and they'll give you accumulation points of eight. And, um, uh, and we suspect that there are no other, there are no other accumulation points. Yeah, my other question is do we know which of those arise as squares of quantum dimensions of modular n of category? Sorry, as, as squares of the quantum dimension of modular n of category. You mean the global dimensions of modular n of category? No, no. We, uh, this numbers are the squares of the of quantum dimension or this quadratic dimension. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, yeah, in no, in the object, yeah. Oh, well. From the graded world, are, are these two common dimensions, and, and are nothing else. And that they, and so and okay, okay, this is so one of these other ones is accidentally in the group. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the answer is that they're small down low enough that we're not seeing very much that is actually coming from the graded world. These are intrinsically two dimensions and themselves are two dimensions. Um, what, I mean, one thing that you can 
C is just an, an object in a, in a modular entry category, uh, the, the dimension is a simple point. Okay? And so certainly the, the indices here all have to be simple point integers just by looking at the double of these guys. But the individual bimodules, the, the bimodules in the objects, tend not to be simple point integers. So that's a sign that simply can't just forget the shading, put on a gradient again. And square root of the dimensions can be the Ah, that's what I thought. Is this uh, sort of a dedicated application of really you want to figure out the meaning of specific things in that kind of way? So it's not just a straight line that you can just do it in the way that you want to do it. Yeah, so this is a, a curious thing. So we've 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 done this for uh, the hardware of the extended hardware. Uh, this is Some point I'd like to know what's the relationship. Oh, yeah. that where diffusion ring occurs when both 